That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Dumb Money, which is the eighth film directed by Craig Gillespie, uh, which premiered at the 2023 Toronto International Film Festival and is being released uh, in limited theatrical window September 15th, 2023, courtesy of Columbia Pictures before it expands thereafter. Do I know a Craig Gillespie movie? Yeah, I think quite several many of uh, his films. In 2007, he had his first and second film released, Lars and the Real Girl and Mr. Woodcock. Which oh, I liked uh, Mr. Woodcock for sure. He, I remember Amy Poehler being entertaining in that. Uh, you know, his Fright Night remake. With my friend Colin? Yeah. Okay. And I, Tanya, and recently Cruella. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, he also has done a lot of TV, Pam and Tommy, etc. Dumb Money is based on the true story of a group of ragtag investors from the Reddit page called Wall Street Bets who banded together to put the squeeze on at least two hedge funds that had bet that GameStop shares would fall. What's your pull quote? Uh, a lukewarm, busy-bodied reenactment concerning a small handful of rich elitists who were made mildly uncomfortable about losing money. <laughs> Basically. Uh, it's also based on a book uh, by Ben Mesrich, The Antisocial Network. So you have to think, like, this happened very recently. There's a book and now a film. My pull quote uh, was, uh, dumb money made me feel stupid. <laughs> no. Okay, so Paul Dano plays this guy named Keith Gill who had a YouTube channel and his handle was, like, Meow Kitty. Roaring Kitty. A Roaring Kitty. And he would give, like stock advice and show like what he's he worked for like a like a mass mutual yes mm -hmm. uh and made a decent living had a wife and a kid but he had this youtube channel where he would show stuff he's investing in show his balance sheet and he has this theory that the entire premise is based on something called short selling mm -hmm. which I'm saying I feel stupid because I watched this in whole ass movie and don't understand what that is still. But he is saying that there are three things regarding this issue that GameStop's being undervalued and two other things I didn't understand. So he's betting the bank against him. Like he's put his life savings, like $53,000 or whatever, into GameStop. And then it kind of goes viral that this guy, Roaring Kitty, is investing in this failing business GameStop. And it gets to a high where like all these people are like, because all these like, the movie's called Dumb Money because I guess like Wall Street type people refer to regular and like traders like who use apps like Robin Hood um, as like dumb money because they're just lucky. Mm -hmm. So all these people are investing in GameStop because of Roaring Kitty and then the stock goes way up. So now people are making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Roaring Kitty is, is up to like, 11 million, I think, when Robin Hood, the brokerage app, mm -hmm. yep, who are in cahoots with like a hedge fund, which mm -hmm. we can get into, mm -hmm. they decide to stop the, the buying of or the trading of GameStop, which causes this huge commotion, stocks fall plummet, but in the end, Roaring kill because everyone's all the public is concerned. Like we we can't see because the Reddit page is down. People can't buy GameStop, so everyone's assuming it's because Roaring Kitty sold. But then when the smoke clears, they are subpoenaed to like a congressional hearing. Like all the key players, including Roaring Kitty, during that congressional hearing, or no, afterwards when he uh, no during the hearing, he says, "I'm not going to sell." Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, now the I, public... His saying is, I like the stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the public gets excited again. GameStop stock goes way up. And then the film just ends. And it says that Roaring Kitty ended up making like 30 some million. And it vanished from public life. The SEC completed their investigation against Ken Griffin. These other hedge funds. No one went Managing to jail. Nobody, no charges were filed. And then the key people in the movie who we can get to, like uh, Anthony Ramos and America Ferreira, it shows how much money they did or did not make. The end. Like, <laughs> um, your pull quote alluded to it, but you said something that I think uh, made sense to me, which is we're not far enough removed from this scenario for it to have a lot of impact. Like, this shit is all like basically like last, like, like a year ago. And then the film doesn't even explain GameStop. Like, 
Yeah. Where, I, where's GameStop now? I'm left unclear about <laughs> are, are their store still open. Uh, but also this, this blurb at the end about how now because of this short squeeze that happened in January of 2021 with GameStop uh, in their uh, public, the, 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 the public float selling short, uh, now we have all these hedge fund managers that are scouring the internet on sites like Reddit that are trying to, uh, you know, stop up these loopholes that the little man has right. been able to find. To so that's how they want to sum up the story, but it's only been like a year. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> And I'm sad to say that I think this film needed this because of the comparison, because I don't really like Adam McKay as a filmmaker, but he did a film about, about a, decade ago called, a decade ago called The Big Short, where uh, the, the, to explain what's going on in the film, like various celebrity cameos show up to basically uh, in plain speak say what's going on. And I almost think this really would have benefited, especially from the odd tone of it, and also with the terminology that I also felt it's just kind of glossing over, except to at the very basic degree that you realize that Seth Rogen and his buddies profit from uh, the failure of a stock. And how exactly that happens is unclear to me. Is, is the mechanics of it are rather unclear, except that it clearly happens. <laughs> I didn't really understand what was happening, except because of people's like body language and reactions to things. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, Seth Rogen's not happy, so that must be bad. Or like, oh, because in the opening of the film, we see that GameStop stock has gone way up, which for a dummy like me is like that's great. But then we see Seth Rogen getting a call from I think Vincent D'Onofrio, like mm -hmm. you need to like. Check the news and get on a call right now because this is bad. I would, uh, like, based on how Seth Rogen is running to the computer, but it's like, I don't under, like, that doesn't make sense to me. Like, why a stock going up is bad, you know. And then you get the juxtapositions of Paul Dano and Shailene Woodley. How much money did we make today and yesterday versus Seth Rogen and Olivia Thurlby in a very throwaway role being, yeah. how much did we lose? A billion today, a billion tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, what did I like? I think there are a lot of interesting people in the movie, and that's probably what kept it tolerable to me. <laughs> sure. So that's good. I really like America Ferrera. Yes. And she's probably my favorite part of this movie. I concur with that because she also seems real and is able to navigate something that could have just have been a very superficial characterization. But that's about it. So what I really didn't like is A, I left this movie about a very specific like technical topic regarding trading, not understanding what it is. Also, the stakes felt very low because... You know, I'm I understand gambling and to, and the biggest thing about gambling is how much you buy in for. Like that's how you tell how much you've lost, right? In this movie, I don't understand because we have Anthony Ramos playing a guy who works at GameStop with a, a boss played by Dane DeHaan who's an asshole. And he starts buying stock based off of uh, Roaring Kitty's advice. And then America Ferrera is a nurse who's buying stock based off of um, Roaring Kitty's advice. And we don't ever really understand how much they've invested so when we see that they're up like a hundred grand 200 grand and then they go down to like five thousand like aren't you still up because you like how much did you put in i so i i didn't feel like scared for them if anything i was frustrated like girl what because america's character gets up to like five hundred thousand and she's a single mom with two kids working as a nurse making sixty five thousand or whatever like you could get your, I mean, they even have a line about how she can buy her son braces and buy a house. And so that was the only sort of tension I felt is like, oh, why don't you get out so you can be comfortable? But in the end, like the the very final scene where they do the, like the, the wrap up, we see that she, like she's currently negative 14,000. Like, what does that mean? Well, compared to what, when we met her was negative a lot more. Sure. Oh, that's right. So mm -hmm. she's been able to clear some debt. Sure. I just... The stakes are very low. I don't understand what's happening. We have too many characters. There's too many people. The college girls, played by uh, Talia Ryder and My Hall Herald. I really I, didn't like them. I, I don't. I... <laughs> and then we have like a weird reunion of people from different movies, like Dano and Seth Rogen from The Fable Men's, and uh, My Hall Herald and Pete Davidson from Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. So the two college girls are lesbians, and they are like working class. So, and then the one girl. Uh, is talking about how her dad worked for this grocery store and some like investors bought it and they used some technical term I didn't understand to like cause the business to fail and they cashed out like the, the rich people cashed out so her dad lost his pension and had to work 
doing like an entry level job until he died just to support his family. And that's why she has had to borrow so much money to go to college. So that's her storyline. And that's why she's really betting on Roaring Kitty's advice. And the two of them end up making a lot of money. But their dialogue, the dialogue in general felt very simple to me. Well, it's all about sticking it to the man, but it's like how much is being stuck to the man. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I don't like the movie doesn't explain how this phenomenon that took course over a number of months actually affected Wall Street. So it just feels very like frivolous to me. Or it made any kind of like systemic impact. I mean, the most interesting part is really uh, the the tidbits from the congressional hearing where you get Maxine Waters and AOC, like real, real um, well, snippets footage. of them. Yeah. yeah, that footage made me, like, so ultimately, because we do get real footage of uh, members of Congress questioning key people in this situation, it just made me want a documentary about this. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking that we just recently, uh, our last podcast was about the movie Stalking Laura, which is also called I Can Make You Love Me with Richard Thomas and Brooke Shields mm -hmm. and how it th there was like a mass shooting, like a very tragic mass shooting that prompted like anti-stalking laws in California. That movie feels more impactful than this movie. Yes, this the impetus for some kind of change being made. Yeah. But, but this just, the only moment is Paul Dano uh, as Keith Gill giving his impassioned speech about how at one time the stock market was a way for someone to succeed and yeah. now it is no longer possible. For I thought that was a nice speech. Yes. And I, and I think Paul Dano did he's, a good job. He's fine. His parents are played strangely by Kate Burton and Clancy Brown. Uh, Pete Davidson, I don't need. I didn't need him. He plays Paul Dano's brother and he's just doing that thing where he's like a loser. So you get to smoke weed all day yeah. and make these comments that are not very funny. Okay. The I tone. Think. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't call this a comedy, but then there are moments like Pete, everything out of Pete Davidson's mouth, I guess, is supposed to be funny. The only part that I thought was kind of funny is when Gabe, um, Seth Rogen is being prepared for his congressional hearing. And the makeup artist? The, well, oh, no, the, yeah. The makeup, well, both the makeup artist and then the two people coaching him, the lawyers coaching him that are like, you're going to do this in here in front of your wine collection. And it's like a huge wine, yeah. And they're like, no, you need to look like you're not lavishly rich. Yeah, I mean, those moments, but again, I don't understand the angle. Like, are we focusing on. I think the better story would have been to focus on regular schmegular people like Anthony Ramos and America Ferreira and how they're taking the advice of this YouTube person to invest in this stock and they start seeing their riches grow and then the chaos that causes in their life and, and, and when they just, because there's no tension, like there could have been tension based off of, are they going to sell? Are they going to sell? What is America going to do? But in this movie, her storyline falls so flat because she is up like 500,000. She takes a first class flight to Florida to like just take a vacation. And while she's there, her stock plummets. Mm -hmm. So on the way back, she's telling a flight attendant like she basically lost her nut. And then the flight attendant goes, I'm going to get you a stronger drink. Like that's all we get for that. Yeah, it's, it's a little weak. I think that Anthony Ramos bit, despite him being a likable character, is also kind of yeah weird. and then i think that's a good point to bring up the soundtrack oh yes movies movies directed by mostly starring white people that are heavily dependent on hip-hop i find interesting in how they're trying to really make something seem cool and fresh yeah because we get uh megan well we get cardi b and megan the stallion on wap we get megan the stallion uh, and her my favorite song her savage, savage and but... then we get kendrick lamar in there like played heavily to the point where the Kendrick Lamar song, we have all the cast like in different parts um, doing whatever they're doing in that moment, singing along to the song. As if they're in a production of Rent. Uh -huh. I thought that was weird, especially like the film opens with um, WAP, but it's on Seth Rogen and his character doesn't seem like he would particularly like this kind of music. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why we were doing that. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it does get a side eye for me that that kind of music's featured so heavily in a film where there are no black people. <laughs> in the movie really no, i mean yeah. except the one lesbian but then we don't really in any scene she's in we don't get those songs no no she's part of the kendrick she's part of the kendrick along, lamar but, yeah yeah but uh, yeah i i don't know hip-hop's not exclusive to black people of but course I think, not but but, but 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 i think the feeling it invokes compared to the visuals we're getting in the characters 
It, it makes it seem like you're just trying to be cool. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. anyway. And I think that is worth commenting on. Mm -hmm. What else do you want to say about this movie? <sighs> Nothing really. I don't know what would lead me to ever watch it again. Uh... Um, I thought it was okay, but I definitely would have craved something else. And then I don't think it was effective enough in making me want to go research more. Like I'm confused about the story and I don't care enough to go read about it. I think it. this could have been a really great intelligent black comedy that is re that would really be what is sticking it to the man is showing showing what elitist assholes these these people are and how the system is so rigged and I, and I think that had this been made in the 70s it would have had that kind of element like or the guy who did blackberry I think that that approach to sure yes I think that mm, where it's clear that he's making fun alongside of these people. Yeah. Um, it Because we didn't even bring up Sebastian Stan, I think is a missed opportunity. Oh. Despite his Chucky doll wig. So the founders of Robin Hood are these two guys, Sebastian Stan and the other one. Baju played by uh, Rushi Kota. Who they're playing it like gay vampires. I don't, I didn't understand that casting choice and like direction because they're not funny. They just look ridiculous. They look like they're from a... And maybe that's what the real people look like. I don't know. But they look like they're from a sizzle, sizzle reel of an interview with a vampire spinoff yeah because we see the real people in the end like in these congressional videos and they don't look that crazy no so I thought that was again. But, but again especially with those two morons I think they really missed the opportunity of showing it I don't know it just it's a very flat comedic approach to me yeah what would you give this movie two and a half I would give it two and a half out of five Hit the thanks button, listen to our podcast. Bye.